Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Drino here. Today we're finishing up with the AIG CT scan playlist. Well, the critical thinking check part of the playlist at least. This one is called Check the Logic. I'm interested to see what sort of logical syllogisms are going to be put forth by an organization that starts every discussion assuming their conclusion. More than likely though, it's just going to be an exercise in projection, with them pointing out the informal logical fallacies in their straw man version of atheist arguments. Let's go! And check number seven about thinking critically about any message is check the logic. See, at this stage in the critical thinking process, you will have already caught many potential fallacies or faulty forms of reasoning in a message. So, for instance, begging the question, also known as the assumed conclusion fallacy? You know, that one where the premises of the argument assume the conclusion is true in order for them to work? That's probably AIG's number one fallacy, given that they refuse to publish anything that doesn't use it in their favor. For instance, by way of a quick recap, in check number three, check the source, you caught any faulty appeals to authority by thinking about how credible the message source was. Yep. So remember back when I covered that check and one of the red flags when browsing the internet that can help you decide if a source is credible is whether or not they are selling products and the purpose of their site is essentially just to counter any information that would make people not want to buy their products? Well, AIG makes their money off of selling homeschool curricula, books, and DVDs to parents that are afraid of their kids learning about evolution in secular school. That's a pretty big red flag, even if they didn't have that atrocious statement of faith that insists that you must agree with their conclusions before you start writing for them. In check number four, check the definitions, you caught any bait and switch fallacies by making sure that no words and meanings changed during the course of the argument. Like the word kind, which changes its meaning depending on what AIG needs it to mean in order to counter whatever point they are countering in the moment. Or even the word evolution itself, which AIG would never define the way that it has been scientifically defined as being a change in allele frequencies in a population over time, because using that definition, evolution falls firmly into the category of observable science, as AIG defines observable science, and they can't have that. In check number five, check for propaganda, you caught any number of fallacies which try to persuade you by appealing to something besides logic, like emotions or aesthetics or popular consensus. Which, again, is one that AIG fails with their abundant use of scare tactics. Appealing to consensus is a bit trickier though, and here it's useful to remember that the informal logical fallacies are just that, informal. They don't necessarily invalidate an argument, but they are red flags to watch out for. In the case of an appeal to consensus, if we're talking about something like, everybody knows that we only use 10% of our brains, that is fallaciously appealing to the consensus. If, however, we are appealing to the consensus of expert opinion on the topic of their expertise, it ceases to be fallacious. The consensus opinion among neurologists is that the claim about only using 10% of our brains is utter nonsense. If we were to live our lives without relying on consensus opinions of experts, we would have to assume responsibility for thoroughly researching everything for ourselves before accepting it, even if it has already been thoroughly researched. So don't drink coffee or tea assuming that the caffeine will help you wake up, it might just be the placebo effect. You'd better not appeal to the consensus of expert opinion that caffeine does result in increased alertness, you should conduct your own double-blind placebo-controlled study, and make sure it's a big enough study to show statistics significance. And you'd need to do this for everything in your life, because you don't want to rely on the consensus opinion of the experts. Did the doctor prescribe you something? That's nice. Better conduct your own trial before relying on the expert consensus. Most people don't have the time or resources to live that way, and so realize that it is best to rely on the consensus opinion of the people that spend their entire careers sometimes studying one specific little aspect of modern science. And guess what? The consensus of expert biologist opinion is that evolution is a thing. The consensus of expert geologist opinion is that the Earth is around 4.5 billion years old. The consensus of expert astronomer and cosmologist opinion is that the universe is is about 13.8 billion years old. In check number six, check for interpretations, you thought about alternative ways to interpret the facts in a message. Oh man, that was so close to alternative facts. I wonder if that was on purpose. 
Yes, check number six was that lovely AIG redefining science into two distinct categories that don't exist in reality. And while we didn't talk about this at the time, thinking about alternative explanations this way can help you spot either or fallacies, which present only two options when more options may be possible. So, like when AIG presents the options as though you are either a Christian or an evolutionist? They will occasionally pay lip service to the fact that there are Christians out there who accept evolution, but the majority of their materials all present the false dichotomy of evolutionist versus Christian. For instance, I once took a class in entomology, which is the study of insects. And in that class, we learned that some evolutionists think that insects' wings evolved from lobes on their exoskeletons, while other evolutionists think that insect wings evolved from gills in the larval stage. Is that supposed to be an example of a false dichotomy? Because that's just stating that there are two main schools of thought on the matter. And given the fact that there is a third option that I found almost immediately upon beginning to research the topic, I'm going to go ahead and say that this isn't some dogmatic dichotomy where people must think that it is either one or the other. The third option is that both hypotheses about the origins of the insect wing are likely to have worked together simultaneously. Of course, this is one of the first studies to make such a proposal, and as such they point out themselves that more research needs to be done before anything can be concluded for sure, but the fact of the matter is that this is not a dichotomy. Those are just the two dominant ideas. So one of our exam questions was, do you think insects' wings evolved from lobes or gills, and why? I can't say for certain, but I would think that the purpose of such a question on a test is not for you to give a technically correct answer, but to show that you have an understanding of the evidence both for and against each position, and are able to weigh the evidence to arrive at a conclusion. And as this is most definitely not a settled question at this time, I'm going to go ahead and assume that the teacher wasn't marking students' answers as wrong for supporting the hypothesis that they personally did not agree with meaning that there is most definitely something that you were supposed to get out of that question other than just certainty about which hypothesis is correct. That presented only two evolutionary options when another option from a biblical perspective, which makes even more sense of the observational facts, states that wings were designed by our intelligent creator God. Yeah, technically speaking, an unfalsifiable magic act could be an option, but that was a science class, so that kind of option wouldn't be presented unless there was some sort of evidence for it. And I'm sorry, but if you read through the literature regarding insect wing development and came to the conclusion that magic makes more sense with the observational facts, facts like the wing serial homologs and abdominal segments that don't grow wings, for instance, then I don't really know what to tell you, because that doesn't make any sense in light of an intelligent designer. It does make perfect sense in light of evolution, though. So those are just some of the fallacies you will have already caught so far in the critical thinking process. Yep. And every single one, except perhaps for the appeal to consensus, has been caught in this very series and are rampant throughout AIG material. Thank goodness for critical thinking check number one, which lets us just ignore it when conclusions that we like rely on fallacious reasoning. Now, you should be left with just the facts and any leftover lines of reasoning about those facts. Nope, not how it works. If you find a logical fallacy in something, finding the fallacy does not automatically mean that you are now in possession of all the facts. It just means that you have found a potential problem with the argument being presented. Just a potential problem, mind you. Remember, being fallacious does not mean something is false. If I say that someone is wrong because they are ugly, that is fallacious. It is committing the ad hominem fallacy. But they can still be wrong. And some of those lines of reasoning may still contain faulty logic you haven't caught. In other words, if you examine a claim for logical fallacies and come away without finding any, but it's a claim that you don't agree with, don't worry, you probably just need more practice catching the faulty logic. It's still there, you just haven't found it yet, so go ahead and read these AIG articles about it. But remember not to apply the critical thinking checks to AIG stuff. So that's what you want to look for next. Now, there are a ton of other logical fallacies out there. But to name just a few common ones, there's circular reasoning. That's the one where the Bible is true because the Bible says it's the word of God, and God can't lie because the Bible says he can't, therefore the Bible is true. When an argument for a point arbitrarily assumes that point is true to begin with. For instance, as you can learn in one of the resources linked to this video, many methods used to date fossils or sediments as being millions of years old are based on assumptions that Earth is millions of years old in the first place. 
And even if I grant that point, which I don't, most dating methods do not make assumptions about how old the Earth is. They just tell you how old the sample is. And often, the sample is older than creationists think the universe is. Now, it certainly does make more sense to conclude that if a fossil which is found on the Earth is millions of years old, then the Earth must also be at least as old as the fossil, but the dating method for the fossil doesn't assume the age of the Earth to reach its conclusion. Kudos to you, though. I figured you were going to go with the example of index fossils as being circular reasoning, using the rocks to date the fossils and the fossils to date the rocks, but that's really more of a Hoven thing than an AIG thing. Also, the resource linked in the video description? It's a DVD you can buy for 18 bucks. So again, selling stuff doesn't necessarily mean that you're full of shit, but it is a red flag. And assuming millions of years to argue for millions of years is circular. Yeah, it would be. But nobody does that. You don't find statements of faith for secular research journals talking about how they won't publish anything unless they agree with the geologic timescale that the Earth has an age of 4.5 billion years. So once again, I will point out that part of the paper review process for the Answers Research Journal, the allegedly peer-reviewed journal that is run by AIG, openly admits that they won't publish anything that comes to a non-Young Earth conclusion, unless they also provide a possible Young Earth alternative to their non-Young Earth conclusion. And the editor-in-chief, that is Ken Ham, will not be afraid to reject papers that he sees as conflicting with the AIG statement of faith. Another fallacy I've seen in evolutionary contexts is an appeal to probability, which takes for granted that something is true because it might be true. Really? Because at least for my part, with regards to things to which there is still scientific uncertainty, like abiogenesis and the pre-Big Bang state of the universe, I tend to withhold judgment. Now, I will say that I think it probably was not a god, because I've never seen any convincing evidence that a god even exists, and the god concept adds extra layers of complexity that don't always make sense, but I am usually quite candid about the fact that I cannot demonstrate conclusively that it was not a god that did it, I just don't see any reason to think that it was. For instance, my biology textbook had a diagram showing how eyes supposedly evolved from simple patches of light-sensitive cells into complex visual organs. And like you can learn more about in some of the resources linked to this video, there are a ton of problems with this idea. Yeah, there's a link there that purports to explain the problems with the evolutionary explanation of the development of the eye. But the problem is that if we apply the critical thinking checks that we've learned in this series so far to this article, we find that it is chock full of problems. Of course, there is the characteristic us versus them dichotomy that AIG likes to present, referring to anyone who is not a creationist as an evolutionist, making themselves appear to be the victims of the attack from secular science, throwing shade at Darwin by calling evolution Darwin's God-rejecting presupposition, despite the fact that Darwin was a Christian while he developed the theory of evolution, and part of the purpose of his voyage on the Beagle was to find the centers of creation. The article goes over all the varieties of eyes that we see in nature today, and explains that even though the evolutionist will point to them, line them up by complexity, and proclaim that a progression of something along those lines might easily have created the eye through evolutionary processes, the different eyes were, obviously, made for different purposes by their creator god, of course. But then, when going over how we know that all eyes share a very primitive common ancestor because of certain shared genetic traits between eyes that appear to have developed independently, they'll switch tracks to the whole common genetic switches are evidence of a common designer thing. So it doesn't matter what the argument is from the evolutionist side, it's either the commonalities that show the evolutionary relationship are actually evidence of a common designer, or the differences are evidence that the designer designed them differently for their environment. So it's lose-lose for evolution there. They also dismiss the fact that computer simulations have shown that complex eyes like ours could plausibly have evolved through minor changes to existing structures in less than half a million years as just a computer simulation. Just because you can simulate it doesn't make it true. They also disparage the author of the study, saying that he doesn't see irreducible complexity as a problem, as though that were something that he should see as a problem, and also as though he didn't directly address this in the introduction of the paper that they are referencing. They also commit the non sequitur fallacy, where a premise or conclusion of an argument doesn't actually follow from the preceding premises. In this case, they talk about how evolutionists consider melatonin to be an evolutionary precursor to the light-detecting protein opsin, because they are similar in structure. They then go on to say, well, that ignores the problem of where the genetic code came from in the first place. 
that's an entirely different problem from the development of a specific protein, and it is such a drastic turnaround that readers of this article are in danger of suffering whiplash. This would be like me telling my kids not to play with matches because they are dangerous, and them responding with the claim that the matches are safe because I don't know where the potassium chlorate on the match head or the red phosphorus of the striker strip originally came from. Like, no, I don't know where they came from, but that doesn't stop me from knowing that they can start fires. And this is a long article, I have only just scratched the surface. So thank you, Ms. Engler, for teaching us how to spot the bullshit in AIG's articles. But by illustrating how eyes might have evolved, assuming those evolutionary changes are even possible, the textbook was basically teaching that eyes did evolve that way, even though that's an assumption from historical science which we cannot directly test, observe, or repeat in the present. I think you might have misunderstood the materials. We do not know for certain that eyes evolved through the evolutionary path that we can see demonstrated by comparing the different kinds of eyes that different organisms have today, but that is a reasonable conclusion. Nobody is saying that it is true because it is probably true. What we are saying is that evolution is more likely than special creation based on the evidence that we have, and we have a plausible evolutionary path for the development of the eye. If you have a better idea of where eyes came from, the scientific community would be happy to hear it, but you need to bring evidence to the table when you present it. I don't think anyone will be impressed with Bible verses. And suggesting that evolution did happen because it could have happened, whether or not that's even true, is a fallacy. No, nobody is suggesting that evolution did happen because it could have happened. We are suggesting that it did happen because it does happen. We can do those observable, repeatable experiments that you guys love so much to confirm it. There are also fallacies of faulty generalizations, such as the statement, scientists think that dinosaurs evolved into birds millions of years ago. Is the generalization there the scientists think part? Because I think that falls under the umbrella that I discussed earlier about the difference between appealing to consensus in general and specifically appealing to expert consensus. This suggests that all scientists agree dinosaurs evolved into birds when really not even all evolutionary scientists believe that. Yeah, the birds are not dinosaurs guys exist. They run counter to the consensus and have shown a remarkable ability to shift goalposts as new discoveries are made, not unlike creationists. So in this case, the overwhelming majority consensus opinion among experts is that birds evolved from dinosaurs and as such are a clade of dinosaurs themselves. You can find experts who dissent from the consensus opinion in basically any field, and occasionally these dissenters are found to be correct, but not often. And when they are found to be correct, it is because they brought actual scientific evidence with them, not non sequiturs like the one in the article about how one protein couldn't evolve from another protein because we haven't figured out the ultimate origin of DNA yet. It's a faulty generalization. No, it's an accurate appeal to expert opinion. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from J. John Heitman, who says, try saying coccolithophore ten times fast. Well, I'm going to set myself up for failure here by saying that coccolithophore is one of the easiest hard sounding words for me to say. So coccolithophore, 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 coccolithophore. Fun fact, my statement about me saying it is an easy word means I'll screw it up is actually a really good example of an appeal to probability fallacy. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the melatonin that is the precursor to the opsin that is my channel. If you'd like to ignore the problem of the ultimate origin of DNA, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time.